Ukraine will become a, mem a member of NATO. Uh, they will also become a member of the EU. The obligation we have now is to, to, to continue to help them uh, prevail in this war, because in the end, if they don't prevail, there's no NATO, there's no EU. Welcome to G Zero World. I'm Ian Bremmer, coming to you today from Munich, Germany, site of the 60th Munich Security Conference. This annual gathering of world leaders and defense officials got underway as a grim milestone approached. It has been two years since Russia invaded Ukraine, starting the deadliest conflict that Europe has seen in decades. The war set in motion a global turning point, which has impacted everything from energy to food prices and supply chains, but also rallied a fraying transatlantic alliance into a unified front. Still, while the vast majority of Ukrainians remain steadfast in their fight, political battles and crisis fatigue in the United States and the European Union are making a victory for Ukraine look all the more elusive. I'll talk about the current state of the war with NATO's Deputy Secretary General, Marcia Juana. But first, two years into Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, one question looms large. What's the plan? By NATO's best estimates, 70,000 Russians have died. 250,000 have been injured over the course of the war, which constitutes some 90% of Russia's pre-war force. Kiev is highly secretive about battle losses, but US officials in August put their death toll around 70,000 Ukrainian troops, with well over 10,000 additional civilian deaths. So as the conflict enters its bloody third year, I ask and try to answer that basic question. What's the plan? The contours of Ukraine's strategy may have shifted with the battle lines, but the core has remained the same, survival. After fending off Russia's all-out offensive in 2022, its much-hyped summer counteroffensive last year was a bust. Ukrainian ground forces today find themselves in as perilous a position as when the war started, with the military's top commander telling a German journalist, and I quote, the enemy is now advancing along almost the entire front line, and we have moved from offensive operations to conducting a defensive operation. General Sirsky only recently took over Ukraine's military after President Zelensky reshuffled the country's military leadership for the first time since the war started. Sirsky replaced the highly popular General Zeluzhny, whom Zelensky blamed for the failed counteroffensive. In the meantime, Ukrainian special forces have launched a series of audacious attacks inside Russia and in the Black Sea to try to keep Moscow on its back foot. What's Putin's plan, you ask? That one's easier. Wait out the clock. Putin is banking on war fatigue, both from the Ukrainian troops in the trenches and the country's Western backers, especially the United States, whose purse strings are tightening. And it may be a sign of Putin's growing confidence that Russian dissident Alexei Navalny died in an Arctic Circle prison earlier this month. Here in Munich, I can tell you that the European Union's ironclad support for Ukraine shows some, and I emphasize some, signs of cracking. Take the $54 billion in Ukraine funding that 27 EU nations recently agreed to. That was only after Hungarian Prime Minister and Putin's closest European friend, Viktor Orban, stood down on his veto threat. His opposition is part of an increasing nationalistic tide sweeping Europe from France to the Netherlands, which privileges isolationism and a softer Russia stance. So what's Europe's plan? Keep the money flowing to Ukraine while it can. In the United States, it may already be too late. European officials that I've been talking with here are straight up freaking out about the US Congress inability to pass a significant funding bill. And even if, and that's a big if, sympathetic House Republicans can pull a $95 billion rabbit out of a hat, it will surely be the last U.S. penny that Zelensky will see until after the November election. Military analysts say Ukraine will, at best, hold existing front lines with a new influx of American weaponry and very likely fall back without it. And speaking of that November election... They asked me that question. One of the presidents of a big country stood up and said, well, sir, uh, if we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay? You're delinquent? He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them to do whatever the hell they want. You got to pay. You got to pay your bills. 
Candidate Trump referring to America's NATO commitments, but this message was just as relevant to non-NATO member Ukraine. If Trump prevails in November, any hope of further Ukraine aid from the United States falls closer to zero. So what is President Biden's plan? Pray to God that suburban moms in swing states stick with them. But that's a topic for another day. Back in Ukraine, 92% of their citizens surveyed last fall said that they would accept nothing short of a total Russian withdrawal from their country. That includes from Crimea in exchange for peace. And as this conflict enters its third year, that's what the fight is about. It's about 44 million Ukrainians who overwhelmingly want to defend their territory no matter the cost. Is that enough to win? Ask me next year, or maybe the year after that. And we begin today with NATO's Deputy Secretary General, Mircea Joanna, who I was speaking with as news broke that Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny had been killed. NATO Deputy Secretary General, Mircea Joanna, so good to see you again. Good to see you again. So Mircea, I don't want to surprise you, but I, I'm literally just hearing uh, that Alexei Navalny is apparently uh, dead, um, according to uh, the international wires. What do we think about a Russian government, a Russian leadership that continues to act in this way? I would say that uh, this is a huge loss for the democratic world and, for, and for, for Russians, because there are lots of Russians that would love to live in a different country. This is the sinister continuation of a tradition of gulags uh, over ha Russian history. And uh, I met uh, Navalny's wife and kid uh, in, in, uh, in Europe a few months back. And I think on a personal note, I think they were ready for him to make the ultimate sacrifice. And uh, I know that uh, this kind of, you know, despotic instincts uh, that are rediscovered now in Russia are doing Russia no good. I think uh, uh, Navalny, even after his, his, uh, his sacrifice for Russia's future, will become even more of a symbol and a martyr. We are losing a great, great, great uh, fighter for freedom. And uh, to be honest, I'm not surprised that this is the kind of instinct of despotic regimes, is to eliminate, even physically, all competition, not allowing any dissent, just one thinking, one rule, and in the end, this will backfire. Uh, you cannot keep it. I know from Romania. Uh, I've seen dictatorship with my own eyes. You think you're immortal in power, and one day uh, the people will find out that there is something else. I, I only hope that the sacrifice of uh, Alex Navalny will not, will not be in vain. And I hope that this will be an example for the young Russians, for the young Russians, uh, the ones who know that there is also another kind of life uh, possible for them. And I hope that his inspiration will stay, will stay for the young ones. Uh, so here we are at the Munich Security Conference, uh, the war uh, in Ukraine now a couple of years on. And tell me where you think it stands militarily right now. Well, we, we gave the somber prediction at the beginning of the war, this will be a war that will be, will be long. And we are not changing our prediction that we don't see on either side uh, enough resources to, to basically change the dynamic of the world, at least for the short, for the short term. I think we also made, uh, in strategic communication, a little bit of over-optimism those before the counter-offensive, and now I think there is a little bit of over-pessimism. I think that the truth is somewhere in between. Uh, you see the Russians becoming more dynamic on the, on the front line. You see the Ukrainians doing massive, uh, you know... In the Black Sea, you mean? Sea. Yeah, yeah. Taking out a lot of the fleet, actually, yeah. yeah. So th there are things that I think we should take them uh, at face value and, and don't don't rush into, into conclusions. But it's clear that this will uh, be prolonged. Politically and militarily, we don't see the conditions for any form of, uh, of uh, cessation of hostilities. And uh, I think uh, the easiest way is for Mr. Putin to, to order to stop the invasion that he ordered uh, two years ago. But nobody's expecting that. Anytime. Of course not. Yeah. Uh, and also we don't expect the Ukrainians, President Zelensky and the Ukrainian people to give up on, on their sovereign uh, land. So yeah, this is here to stay with us. Um, we have the obligation and the interest uh, to continue to support Ukraine. 99% of the support for Ukraine comes from NATO allies. Uh, and uh, we anticipate that this topic will be, will be uh, front and center at the Washington summit, our anniversary summit in July, in July. in Washington, D.C., yeah. 
Now, what I don't expect is going to be front and center of the Washington summit is a commitment for Ukraine to join NATO, or certainly, I mean, a time frame, even though the Secretary General has still said that that is the intention, that they will eventually become members. We don't know how, we don't know when. Is, do, you, do you think that there's any possibility there's movement on that? Listen, um, Ukraine is getting closer to NATO every day. Uh, they're becoming more interoperable with us. Uh, there's a level of trust uh, and, and synergies. Um, and uh, I do not anticipate a, a firm uh, commitment in terms of a date in Washington to be, to be announced. But I think Washington will be a very interesting bridge towards uh, NATO membership. Uh, eventually, with NATO playing a bigger role uh, in uh, interoperability, uh, in the future of forces in Ukraine, in making sure that we, 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 we help them uh, transform uh, in a way that will be fully compatible with us. So what Secretary General Stoltenberg says, what all of us are saying, and also the key allies are saying, Jake Sullivan said this, uh, this issue also when he visited with us uh, uh, 10 days ago, is that Ukraine will become a, mem a member of NATO. As a Romanian, uh, they will also become a member of the EU. Uh, the obligation we have now is to, to, to continue to help them uh, prevail in this war, because in the end, if they don't prevail, there's no NATO, there's no EU. It's just a return to the sphere of influence of Russia, which is something uh, I believe Ukrainians uh, are fighting against and also we are fighting against. Now, when you say if they don't prevail, um, I haven't heard anyone credibly believe that the Ukrainians are going to be able to militarily get their land back. Uh, and when I say their land, I mean, I guess I should be saying all of their land, but at a minimum, at an absolute minimum, the territorial boundaries uh, that existed before the Russian invasion on February 24th. Um, do, do we have to increasingly understand that as a reality? Listen, uh, wars are unpredictable by definition. And it's very difficult to, to, to make, you know, uh, a forecast, a foresight of where these things would go. But I know one thing, that Ukrainians, with our help, recuperated 50% of the territory occupied by Russia in the initial stages of the, uh, of the war. Mm -hmm. So there is room uh, for them to do even better. Uh, and uh, this depends on their own capacity to continue to mobilize the public opinion and, of course, to have enough forces for us to do better in helping them. So I would say the one thing, if they continue to have the same, you know, determination and bravery to fight, and I don't see uh, any change in that, and if we continue to help them at levels that are appropriate to the intensity of the war, they have all the chances in the world to do even better on the battlefield. Now, I mean, unfortunately, um, the big piece of that relies on the consistent military, economic, and therefore political support coming from the United States, which has done the lion's share of the lifting so far. And of course, that has become a very significant bone of contention uh, for the Biden administration inside the House of Representatives. Uh, it increasingly looks like a much bigger challenge to be able to continue to get that funding. And even if it happens, probably at lower levels, and maybe this the last time around. What is that doing? That, that process has been going on for a few months now. How is that affecting NATO allies? How is that affecting the Ukrainians? Let me put a little bit uh, support for Ukraine in perspective, because we speak here of military support, mm -hmm. and U.S. has the lion's share because of the size of the country and, uh, and the uh, industrial and military might of the, of, of, uh, of the U.S. But if you put all the support for Ukraine in the last two years, uh, military, economic, macroeconomic, humanitarian, name it, European allies or non-US allies of America uh, did more in terms of footing the bill. So more than 50% yep. of the support for Ukraine comes from non-allies. Mm -hmm. I'm also seeing, uh, and Secretary John Stoltenberg released a public report about defense spending in Europe. There was a big conversation uh, in, in the US for good reasons, that you just cannot expect you, the American taxpayer, to foot the bill for, for European security. Europeans have to do better, and we are doing better. Uh, uh, the number that we have now is far from being perfect. Our 18, uh, France is 2%, will be 19 allies uh, today. 
But if you put in on aggregate what uh, the non-US allies in NATO are doing, we are 2% on aggregate because Poland is 4.5, because Romania is 2.5, because the Baltics. So I think there is a political conversation in the US. But as someone who knows uh, America well, uh, I think that there is beyond this very partisan period of election, that's, that's democracies. I think there is a realization in the end that Ukraine is more than Ukraine. And Ukraine is more than European security. That Ukraine is an, an indicator of the willingness and the capacity of the West to be able to cope with challenges coming from China or anywhere else. And if you see also from an American perspective, which is a global superpower, uh, that you see Russia, China, North Korea, and Iran ganging up, you start seeing a world that you need your allies. And I think in the end, this alliance, 75 years uh, in the next few weeks, uh, will be as indispensable to America and to all of us like it has been uh, since the inception, uh, three quarters of a century back. In the last few weeks, we've seen much more uh, talk about the Russians increasing their troop levels uh, on the Estonian border, for example. Is this an environment where NATO governments, NATO allies, are thinking more seriously that they could be in a direct, not a proxy fight, not a war in Ukraine, but in a direct war with Russia? We are undergoing, as we speak in NATO, the most important transformation of our deterrence and defense, military planning, command and control, force structure, multi-domain operation, exercising, steadfast defender is still going on. That's the largest exercise. Since 1988. Since 88, yeah. So the business of NATO, and this is something we know, and Russia knows, that the best uh, uh, deterrence is strong defense. And in a way, uh, this discussion about Russia moving, they don't have many troops to move, to be honest, because most of the troops are, uh, are boggled down in, in Ukraine. Yeah, the Finland border doesn't look very yeah, This, this is my point. Yeah. They're now harvesting the seeds of their own strategic era um, uh, in attacking Ukraine. They had Finland and Sweden, two very staunch neutral countries. Sweden. Uh, has been neutral since 1812, 1812, Finland more recently. Right. So now what we have, we have a NATO, and Russia has to, 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 to deal with a NATO that is having an eastern flank from, from the Barents Sea, from the North Sea, to the Baltic, to the Black, and to the Mediterranean Seas. And we are doing our part. So we don't see uh, from Russia uh, the capacity, and to be honest, not even the intent today to go against a NATO ally. Uh, but we also see Russia being exceptionally uh, unpredictable, very dangerous. And I think that we could suspect for the next period for them to focus on Ukraine and also really unleashing against all of us all the instruments of hybrid warfare, cyber attacks, disinformation. So I would say that we are not seeing an imminent risk against us. Uh, the more we do in defense, and the more our plans become executable, the, the, the least chances for Russia to, to dare to do something against us, against us. But, you know, Russia is unpredictable. Uh, and we have this kind of uh, self-perpetuation of leadership at the top. Um, there is also a risk that, uh, you know, staying for too long in power, you start, you, you start seeing the world with lenses that are not realistic anymore. And uh, this is something that we do well. We don't see an imminent threat to our, to our alliance. And the more we do things together, the, sl the, the slower the chance. Can we, can we rule it out totally? No. Uh, Russia remains uh, aggressive, unpredictable. And uh, this kind of uh, very personalized leadership at the top can always create surprises. So we have to be better be prepared. Mr. Juana, thanks for joining us on G0. Yeah, I'm Bremer. Thank you and your wonderful team. That's our show this week. Come back next week. And if you like what you see, or even if you don't, but you find yourself uncomfortable that I'm in Germany, we can fix that. Take a minute to sign up for our most excellent morning newsletter. It's called G-Zero Daily.